good evening. I thank the IOMA Kodapakram for giving me this opportunity to stand in front of you and deliver this lecture. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Vagadasram, I know him for a long time. So, <coughs> so I'm just, just sticking on to only the basics, so, which may be relevant to our day to day practice. I'm not just going to all life and stuff. So, ECG becomes an important tool in our general practice, whatever day to day practice what we are doing. And, uh, Particularly, identifying a patient who has have, who is having a myocardial infarction, particularly ST elevation MI, becomes very, very important in delivering the treatment on time. So, the role of primary care physicians and uh, family physicians becomes very, very important in identifying such patients because you people are the first point of contact for such patients because majority of them don't come to tertiary care hospitals or to the long hospitals or to the uh, corporate hospitals for primary care. So they seek the family physician. So at least the basics of ECG, we are able to identify, yes, this is what it is, and we are able to take some decisions about referring a patient or administering some emergency therapy. It will be very, very useful in saving the myocardium. So how to pinpoint the location of myocardial uh, ischemia or infarction and coronary artery occlusion. So this is how this is going to be the gist of my talk for the next uh, 15 minutes. So why should you locate the culprit artery? Why should you identify which vessel is involved? There are probably three coronary arteries for all of us. Two. Left side, there is a left coronary artery and the right side, the right coronary artery. The left coronary artery divides into the left anterior descending, which supplies the most anterior wall and the left circumflex artery which supplies the posterior wall of the on a, in a gross uh, description. So why do you need to locate the culprit artery? First thing, the difference in plan of management. I'll just tell one example for each of these uh, points. Plan of management becomes very, very important when it comes to identifying which territory is involved. Say for example, if a patient has got an inferior wall in mind, Inferior wall MI means right coronary artery is most of the time involved. And this gentleman also most of the time may have a right ventricular involvement. So if there is an RVMI, patient generally presents to you with gross hypotension. In such a case, if you are not able to identify which artery it is and you start pushing a nitroglycerin for relief of pain, it will cause more harm than giving, not giving nitroglycerin. So in such scenario, identifying the culprit vessel becomes very important. Difference in clinical presentation. Clinical presentation differs according to the artery which is involved. Say for example, if it's a same inferior wall MI can present to you as a complete heart block with a syncope. Patient just drops down, you do an ECG and you see bradycardia and some ST elevation and that becomes very important to identifying which artery it is involved so that you can decide <coughs> on the next one. Plan of treatment is very very important. Based on the ECG you can decide what will be the therapeutic modality for this gentleman. And identifying the concrete artery is very, very important for a person who performs an intervention so that he can decide on which tool to utilize the moment you enter into the cath lab. So you have a proper plan in place. So you, you, you can decide which block, which guiding catheter you need, what are the balloons which you will require, which one you will require, and what will be a, whether the patient requires a temporary pacemaker or not. All these you can decide before you enter the cath lab. So the identifying the culprit artery or locating the culprit artery becomes very, very important before you administer the therapy. So just a gross view of the coronary arteries and the leaves. So there are totally three coronary arteries. The right coronary artery, which supplies most of the uh, inferior and posterior wall plus the right ventricle. And the leads which point towards the right coronary artery as depicted here, lead 2, 3 and ABF. The left system, the left main, divides into the left anterior descending artery which runs through the AV2 and the left circumflex which runs behind the heart. So LAV supplies most of the anterior wall and the interventric receptor. If you see the circumflex, it supplies posterior and the postrobasal wall predominantly, this one. So the leads which point towards the right coronary artery or the inferior territory will be lead 2, 3 and AVF. And the LAD territory, which is from V1 to V5, V6, 
and circumflex generally it is the well, actually it's a lateral most leads so mostly you would require some lateral extension of these leads so this is just a depiction of the coronary anatomy pertaining to the ECG leads so before we decide on localizing the uh, artery which is involved, you need to know what is meant by a coronary artery dominance. So everybody has a single artery which becomes dominant, either the left or the right. What is a right dominant system means? The coronary artery that gives a PDA. PDA is a branch which supplies the inferior wall of the left ventricle. Inferior wall of the left ventricle. This determines the dominance in a particular person. Most of us, 85% of us have right coronary artery which is a dominant artery. And 7 to 8 percent have left dominant, and the, the remaining 8 percent have co dominant system where the PDA arises from both these arteries. So, a right dominant system implies that the PDA is supplied with the right coronary artery, mostly 90 percent, it's actually 85 percent of the people. And left dominant system, PDA is supplied with the left circumflex artery. So, when I, whenever I'm mentioning this uh, inferior infarct, it is basically the wall of the left ventricle which we are mentioning. So generally right ventricle is mentioned as separately and particularly if it is an inferior wall, it means inferior wall of the left ventricle. So that is what it is. So anterior infarct means anterior wall of the left ventricle. Okay. So this is the picture of the vascular supply of the LV just to understand. So the parts of the left ventricle can be divided into the apical portion, mid portion and the basal portion. So you just cut it across, you see this, this anterior anterior superior wall. So this whole area is mostly supplied by the left anterior descending artery. So hence LAD supplies almost 60% of the myocardium and no wonder it is called the widow making artery uh, 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 layman term. And circumflex of course small area posterior lateral wall and the inferior portion is supplied to the right coronary artery just for understanding which artery supplies which area. So the most important thing particularly when it comes to the conduct, this also you should be aware. So you can identify if there is any problem with the conduction system by the ECG and locate exactly which artery is involved. So three important things you should remember. One is the sinoatrial node, where it is supplied. The second is AV node. And the third one will be the his bundle or the left bundle branch. So the arterial supply from the sinoatrial node and the AV node most of the time it comes from the right coronary artery. So that is the reason whenever there is a blockage of the right coronary artery leading on the inferior wall in mind, they develop AV blocks. Complete heart block, they can develop complete heart block, they can develop two one AV block, they can develop first degree AV blocks. And uh, that's very, very important in locating the arrhythmia of a patient, AV blocks of a patient and desiring on that treatment. Then left bundle branch is mostly supplied by the LAD. The septal arteries come from the LAD. So if at all there is any occlusion of the left LAD, patient can have left bundle branch block which can be the only presentation. New onset left bundle branch block is an important manifestation of occlusion of LAD, acute occlusion of LAD. So remaining all these posterior fascicle, anterior fascicle, now there is little variation. Mostly these are all supplied by the right coronary artery branches. The important things to remember would be AV nodal supply from the right coronary artery and any left bundle branch supply from the LAD. These two things we have to remember. So the locating the culprit artery in ST elevation MI or ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. So the location of this uh, um, culprit artery becomes very very important only in patients who present with ST elevation. I will explain to you why. The leads V1 to V2, we all know that it's septal, proximal LAD. Please remember this, this is a very, very important slide. And V3, V4, it points to the anterior. V1 to V6, it is predominantly anteroseptal. V5, V6 comes to the apex of the left ventricle, where the involvement of distal LAD are dominant RCA, super dominant RCA. Lead 1, anterior, lateral, lateral most portion, so high lateral, that's what we call, and circulate by the circumflex territory. 2, 3, anterior, we know it is inferior. 90% by RCA and 10% in a dominant circumflex. V7, V8, V9, we have to remember to take all these extended leads into the lateral whenever you are suspecting a post-lateral MI, particularly circumflex environment where you can see the ST elevation. I will explain to you on the subsequent ECGs. 
So in non-ST elevation, we were talking about this is actually for ST elevation MMI. In non-ST elevation MMI, which is also one important uh, aspect of the conundrum of acute coronary syndrome, where it is difficult to localize which artery is involved, where exactly it is involved. Particularly, leads with ST depression do not reflect ischemic areas. It's very, very difficult to pinpoint to which area is ischemic based on ST depression in a in STEMI patient. T inversions also do not correlate with any significant uh, territorial variation, except for two exceptions, which these two syndromes you should remember, Wellen syndrome and deep intestine, which I'll be explaining to you. Wellen syndrome, this is this Wellen syndrome and deep intestine syndrome, these are some variants of presentation of acute occlusion of LAD. <coughs> which is the LAD which is affected in both these. The ECG findings will be biphasic T waves and anterior leads. V1 to V4, you see biphasic T waves. There is no ST elevation, there is no significant loss in the R wave, and there are no uh, significant T wave inversions. Except if you are very closely observing, you will see biphasic T waves. Symptoms suggestive of new onset angina, biomarkers may be positive, and particularly when you are dealing with such patients, you, there must be high, in, high index of suspicion. Because identifying such patients is very, very important because the proximal LED is the one which is the culprit. This is an ECG of a Wellen syndrome. If you see here, there is not gross ST elevation when compared to the baseline, but see the T waves here. This is actually a biphasic T wave, very classical biphasic T wave in V1 to V4. You don't see all those extensive changes which you see in an anterior volume line. But this is the important point towards the <coughs> proximal LED occlusion. De Winter syndrome, this is also one variant of acute occlusion. Upsloping ST depression of 1 to 2 millimeters and precordial leads, tall positive symmetric T waves and there won't be any R wave, R wave progression will be poor. There is no ST elevation in these patients and minimal ST elevation in lead area which is a very soft sign. So this is also very important as it also signifies proximal LED occlusion. You can see this ECG. See this? This is a very hyperacute type of T waves and there is not much of ST coding which you see in ST elevation MI. ST elevation MI. And see the R wave. There is no R wave at all. There is poor progression of R wave from V1 to V3. And there are some reciprocal changes here in the inferior leads. So this is de Winter syndrome and these two are some variants where it is actually a total occlusion of LAD but without any ST elevation. So the right coronary artery, I'll just go through the, these things. Right coronary artery supplies the entire right ventricle via the right marginal artery. 90% of the cases RCA gives the PDA, hence it becomes a dominant artery. 60% RCA gives off branches to SA node and the AV node. AV node it is 90% it is by the RCA. So right coronary artery is very very important. So it manifests as inferior wall infarction where you have ST segment elevation leads 3, 2, 3 and ADF. The ST segment elevation is highest in lead 3. If it is, there is one small way we, where we can identify whether it is a circumflex, dominant circumflex or a dominant uh, right coronary artery based on this ST segment elevation. If in lead 3 it is more than in lead 2, mostly it is a right coronary artery. And if it is lead 2 more than lead 3, then it points towards a circumflex which is dominant. This is all some soft signs. Reciprocal ST depression you can appreciate in lead 1 in ABR as you see in this ECG. See this bronze ST elevation in 2, 3 ABR. If you see 3 ST elevation is more than in 2 and you see this reciprocal changes in lead 1 and ABR. Okay, bronze ST depression here. So this is a classical case of ST elevation in fear of all MI. When it is inferior at RVMI, how is it? Right sided chest leads are demanded. So whenever you have an inferior volume, I insist on a right sided lead. That's very important because most of the time these two are combined and present, present together. So V3R, V4R, V5R, it is actually mirror image on the other side, that's all. So we show ST segment elevation. So ST segment elevation in right ventricular, in particular identifying right ventricular infarction becomes very important in de determining the treatment of the patient. So ST segment elevation and right ventricular infarction have much shorter duration. The ST elevation is not clearly appreciated in particularly the right side of these. You need to look for it because the right ventricle is thinner when compared to the left ventricle. So the infarction time taken is very less. So you don't have that much of ST segment deviation. That's very important. So there will be very minimal ST elevation in V3R, V4R, V5R, which we have to look for, particularly in association with the inferior volume, like this. 
you see in inferior units you see gross ST elevation, but particularly in V4R, VFIR, you don't see that much of ST elevation when compared to this. So this is a very clear cut example that the left right ventricle has a thinner muscle when compared to the left ventricle. So the transmural infarction gives rise to a significant ST vector in 2-3 AVF, particularly when it points to the left ventricle, and the right ventricle the deviation is less. So I'm sorry these images are not playing, I want to show some images, none of them are playing. I'll just uh, go through this. This was some primary angioplasties which I did in the sense, so I just wanted to show you some pictures. <coughs> Sorry, I'm not playing this posterior wall in mind. So posterior wall in mind occurs if the artery is supplying the posterior wall, that is the either the circumflex or the right coronary artery is affected. So ST segment depression you see in V1 to V ST segment depression, please note this. You see ST segment depression in V1 to V3 and V1 and ADL. But V1 and V3 show tall R waves. This is very important. Tall R waves, positive T waves with ST depression in V1 to V3. That is significant of a posterior MI. These are actually the reciprocal changes. If you take V7, V8, V9, you will see ST elevation with the T inversion. Okay, just invert the ECG and see, then you will be able to appreciate the T wave inversion. This is a this is a classical example of true posterior MI. If you see, see the R wave is upright here, tall R waves. See the ST depression here and T waves are upright. Generally in an anterior, say for example, this also can you can think of anterior MI, but generally there will be T wave changes, either there will be T wave inversion or a biphasic T wave. The T waves are never so much upright in an anterior MI. So if you just this and see, you will see ST depression, ST elevation with the T inversion. So that is how a posterior wall MI is. Now venating, venating is an important artery, supplies Two thirds of the IV is anterior, two thirds of the interventricular septum, antero superior wall, so apic, sorry, apical area. So most of the uh, left ventricle is supplied by the LED. So LED may stretch all the way up to the inferior wall and supplies most apical area, infraopical area, because it winds around the apex. And very, very rarely, it is very, very long and supplies the inferior wall also, where we call it as the wraparound LED. When, suppose you have a, a patient with a wraparound LED having a top occlusion. <coughs> that myocardial damage will be significant if you don't, if they're not revascularized right? because both the anterior and the inferior wall both are at your body. So anterior MI, proximal LED occlusion, there is slight difference and mid LED or distal LED occlusion, there is a slight difference. The area is affected, massive infarction in all of the basal parts, anterior, superior, lateral and IVS because all the branches are cut off, diagonal, septal branches, everything is cut off if there is a proximal LED occlusion. Occlusion proximal to the first septal and diagonal branches causes elevation in V1, V4, V1, V1, V1 which was an extensive anterior wall MI. Reciprocal ST depression you generally notice in the inferior leads, 2, 3 AVF, rarely in V5, V6 also. And right part branch block in the presence of ST elevation is not a good sign because it is almost the proximal or the austere LED which is top here through So RTBB in the presence of ST elevation in anterior leads is very, very significant. Occlusion between the first septal and first diagonal usually spares the interventricular septum, which becomes the mid LED or the distal LED. So this is an example of an anterior wall MI. If you see the ST elevation is gross in V1 to almost V6. This is called a tombstone ST elevation, which is very, very significant of a proximal LED occlusion. You see the reciprocal changes in 2-3 AVF, significant ST depression. So distal LED occlusion, occlusion distal to first diagonal and first septal will spare basal parts of the anterior wall. So generally the ST segment elevation is seen in V2 to V6. Very rarely there will not be any ST elevation in V1 or AVL and no reciprocal changes. So middle LED, distal LED, relatively better prognosis. Hemodynamically they remain a little stable. So this is another example of an anterior MI ECG. See the ST elevation, bronze ST elevation in V1 to V4 and significant ST depression in the, the inferior leads. So this is another example of an anterior wall. This is probably a middle LED because if you see there is not much of significant ST elevation here and there are no reciprocal changes here. So and uh, uh, of course it limits from V2, not much of elevation V1, V2 to V3, V4, V4, V4 up to V4 it is there. So probably it is a middle LED occlusion.
circumflex. 90% of individuals, we know that like it's right dominant. When 10% of the people circumflex supplies the basal and mid parts of the posterior wall. So generally, the posterior and the lateral wall is very difficult to capture on the 12 lead ECG. So you need to take the extended lateral leads like V7, V6, V7, V8, V9. So in 10% of the individuals, coronal circulation is less dominant as we have mentioned. Can I take two minutes? So the LCX supplies the heavy load in 10% of all individuals. So posterior MI, true posterior MI is classical of LCX occlusion. Also got posterior or infrabasal infarction. ECG changes resemble those in post infarction due to occlusion and RCA. It's almost the same. Actually, ST segment elevation you see in V7 to V9, lateral leads. Reciprocal ST segment depression V1 to V3 and tall R waves and positive R waves in the same ways. We have described this already. I have shown in the ECG. See this. V1 to V3. So you see this ST depression. And V7, V8, V9, if you see this, just the opposite of this. There is ST elevation here significantly and T inversion. Okay. And not much of changes in the inferior limbs. So this is very, very important. This occlusion of left main coronary artery can be identified in the ECG. This becomes very, very important because left main occlusion generally patients don't make it to the hospital because they are hemodynamically very unstable, hypotensive, and gross arrhythmias are very common. They have cardiac arrest out of hospital. LMC is the origin of NAD and LCX. Occlusion will cause massive infarction with very poor prognosis. We can suspect occlusion if there are some very subtle changes. ST is a diffuse ST segment depression in most of the ECG leads which classical presentation of angina and uh, hypotension. And this is one important thing which we need to look into. ST segment elevation in AVR, isolated ST segment elevation in AVR is one very, very important indicator of left main occlusion. So if you see here, see the ST segment here. Rest of the places, the ST segment seems to be okay, except in lethal AVR where the ST segment is grossly elevated, homing type. And if you see diffuse ST depression, which is not confirming to any particular territory. So this is very important. Diffuse ST depression with elevation in AVR is very important. This is another example of a left main occlusion. See the AVR ST elevation with diffuse ST depression in all the leads. So if you get such a picture with the classical presentation, then we need to think of left main occlusion. And these type of people to me require immediate attention, probably an urgent intervention. So if you have time, we can just go through some three, four ECGs. Is that fine? Eight topics are there. Yes, oh, sorry. Then. Thank you. Think what you expect in the X-ray test. 